on camera. Okay, today's June 16th, 19, uh, 19, 2017. Uh, my name is Roger Soisette. Uh, we're here at the History Center with William Lounsbury continuing uh, the recording that we've begun earlier. Uh, Mr. Lounsbury, I believe we left off uh, when you were in the Pacific. Uh, this is just before the beginning of the atomic bomb test. Okay. Uh, I had been sent out there to join a B-36 weapons effects project where they fly aircraft in a safe vicinity of uh, nuclear weapons testing to uh, see what the, the effect on the aircraft may be. Um, the B-36 was from SAC, Fort Worth, Texas. And I was assigned to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, the Wright Aero Lab at that time. As a project engineer in that particular business, it was my first assignment in the, the uh, situation and they were the aircraft and the crew and all the engineers and the people had been already gotten out there in the, in the Pacific when I got back to Dayton from my aborted assignment as a um, back to B-29s. Uh, so essentially, as I said, you fly a big aircraft in a safe position, uh, distance and position, and see if they see if but see if you can if you record the uh, the effects on the aircraft. I am curious. How did they know what was a safe distance? Ah. It's a good question, but uh, it's the usual. Uh, Let's see what happens. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> this, uh, you might say, uh, well, this is probably a safe distance, so we'll add another 10 or 20 miles or something like that. Um, Do you recall what that distance was? No, really, I don't. Okay. It it would vary with the type of aircraft that was being tested. Mm -hmm. The uh, we finished that work with no significant, uh, no no damage, particularly to the B-36, and uh, it was just flown against one nuclear blast. So everybody went on that project, went home, and back to work. My next assignment out of that group was uh, at the Nevada Proving Grounds uh, with uh, <coughs> uh, fighters and uh, Of course, we wanted, in this in this case we wanted to get we uh, wanted to get definitive damage and uh, 
So we had to use drones and the uh, F-80s had been, a bunch of F-80s had been converted to, to drone capability and they were based at Eglin Air Force Base, one of the uh, outlying fields. The, the idea was to fly a group of three, one close, one closer, one closest. Figuring we'd try, particularly, to get a knockdown. The, uh, it was a very, very interesting project, particularly once we got to the flight. Uh, the first aircraft that took off uh, without a pilot aboard uh, flew straight on ahead into the rising mountains surrounding the uh, air base there and was destroyed. Uh, we, I believe, I seem to recall that we did have a spare and uh, they launched it. And so the, the uh, group went out to the blast site and uh, went through the program and uh, we knocked one down. One received considerable damage and the third one was essentially unscathed. The uh, instrumentation packages were contained in uh, rather fat bulbous containers hanging on bomb racks that the uh, F-80s had, or these, these F-80s at least. I can't remember whether that was standard on the F-80, which was a fighter plane. And uh, so those were dropped and parachuted from the damaged aircraft and recovered. And considerable information was gained from that concerning fighters. The next project I was assigned to was going to be at uh, the Pacific Proving Ground again and it was I was going to be a project engineer on on an F-89 which uh, would be placed at the usual known safe distance And uh, before we got too far into that project, I was uh, pulled off and uh, assigned to a B-52 project for I guess it was the same blast series, Operation Hardtack. And uh, to go in uh, the spring of 19, memory is short, uh, 1958. Now that was uh, considerable interest to me and everybody else. The B-52 was provided by Boeing and 
uh, all instrumented and in the instrumentation was all integral to the aircraft structure and uh, it was fitted out on the pretty much on the product production line the test aircraft we uh, Got it out to NOE Talk, which was the home base in the uh, that area out there in the Pacific for uh, aircraft. It was, the other islands didn't have uh, much in the way of airstrips or living quarters or anything else. But Anahuay Talk was pretty well equipped and it wasn't a bad place to be for a couple of months. We uh, went through some practice situations and uh, the blast that was scheduled for us that we were scheduled to participate in came up and we flew and got uh, bumped around some, but uh, no damage, no, no danger. And uh, when I came back to the States from that, uh, shortly after I got back to Wright Field, I was picked for assignment to SAC to uh, be a navigator in a KC-135 KC squadron. And uh, that looked, uh, that was up in Northern Maine at Loring Air Force Base, which is Northern Maine, or was at the time, and no longer in, in use. And we spent three years there, my wife and two daughters with me, suffering through three winters and I became a squadron navigator for the tankers. We mostly uh, refueled B-47s on the, their way to Europe. The B-52s that we were, was the, were the bombers and squadron in our group didn't didn't need uh, any extra fuel to get to their assigned Cold War targets should they open up the Cold War again. And we spent 1958 to 1961 there. Uh, one small bright spot for my family was that uh, I think our second summer, they decided Loring had one wide, long runway, and it was breaking up and having problems. And they decided to resurface it, and the bomber crews went down to Puerto Rico to Ramey Air Force Base to transition into uh, a uh, newer grade of B-52. And uh, as often happens, some wives went along on their own money and everything. And my wife said, 
we're going down. Uh, the tankers were being assigned to Goose Bay, Labrador to stay in the uh, flight pattern for their B-47 uh, Cold War contingency. Time period there is about 1960, and you're talking about an upgrade on the B-52. We're still flying B-52. Yeah. Does that they, amaze you? The, yeah. <laughs> this, this upgrade was to the uh, current, what is it? D or G model? Anyway, I can visualize when about only one visual change and that was the, the vertical stabilizer was shortened and wasn't as tall as it had been on the earlier models but I don't remember for sure the uh, designations but it the B-52 is as you say very durable and is a very much a part of the Air Force. Mm. Anyway, uh, my wife and the two girls went down to Puerto Rico, and I went to Labrador with the B with the KC-135s. But uh, luckily, I was able to get uh, two or three visits down to down to uh, Puerto Rico on uh, tanker flights that we needed to go down and re reload something or bring things back to Goose Bay and, and uh, so I did get to see them some during that summer but that was about the only good thing out of being up in northern Maine almost to the Canadian border. I get the feeling you weren't real fond of Maine. Nah, we weren't. <laughs> we weren't on the uh, coast, which has its some advantages, but it's all cold and snowy and messy uh, in the wintertime. Yeah, I don't think they call them beaches up there, do they? No. So, that lasted through into the uh, fall of 1961, and I uh, was assigned back uh, to Dayton in the Inspector General's office which is not a very <laughs> enjoyable assignment. And I was told that would only last for a year, which sounded good. And all of a sudden, before that year was up, the system, Air Force Systems Command said, uh, we're going to consolidate the Inspector General's Division of the Systems Command at Andrews Air Force Base in uh, Maryland, outside of Washington. So you can all pack your bags and uh, plan to move to Washington in a few days or weeks. And uh, we did. <clears throat> the uh, the the tour there in the IG lasted another year, I believe, and then I stayed there in the Systems Command headquarters in. Uh, project engineering assignment for three more years. Uh, 
uh, during this time President Kennedy was assassinated. We attended the funeral procession out on the boulevards in Washington where everybody, everybody was very sad and of course it was a very sad time. Uh, in try to think what I was working on in Maryland. Hmm. Well, you got a notation here for Eglin Air Force. Oh, well, that was. That was uh, from Maryland. We went to California and then back to Eglin. Uh, so that's a, that's a ways off. Okay. Anyhow, maybe it'll come to me. But my next assignment uh, was uh, cross country in uh, still in the Air Force Systems Command but in a very unusual, to me, for me, situation. We lived in Torrance, California, and uh, the girls worked pretty well on their educations there, and Gail, our older daughter, graduated from high school. The job I had was out there was head of an organization called uh, well the only thing I can think of right now is SESP Space anyway had to do with uh, space work. Uh, a lot of people wanted to take small projects that they were working on into space and see what they could do with whatever it was they had. And uh, their project was not big enough to use its own, have its own booster equipment to get them up there. So our job was to provide uh, use and using uh, X or worn out, we might say, or former ballistic missiles. One project used a Titan III launched out of uh, Cape Kennedy in Florida. Uh, another one used the Atlas. We launched that from Vandenberg, uh, California. And another, another one used a Thor missile and that was launched from Vandenberg. The uh, Titan was, mission was totally successful. The Atlas uh, booster worked fine, but when the payload section was launched off of the booster, it had trouble and uh, most of the uh, experimental projects were, were lost without any data. The Thor project worked all right too. From there, I uh, 
after four years, anyway, take, taking us to 1972, and, uh, and I was reassigned to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida and was working in the office that was basically called Guns and Rockets and developing uh, better guns and better rockets to use on Air Force aircraft. After a year or so of that, they decided to, uh, I don't know when they decided, but said we're going to develop an armament museum using that old theater slash gymnasium building over there. And uh, we want you, Lieutenant Colonel Lounsbury, to be the first director and put it together and get it running. So that was an interesting assignment. I went to work on that. Uh, we were had refurbishing the building, uh, rounding up. Uh, material to use for exhibits, getting uh, several retired aircraft, an F-104 and uh, I, think a, I think we had a C-57 Canberra and uh, a couple others. Probably a B-24, maybe a B-17. I don't remember exactly anymore. Since it's still quite a ways in the past. But it was an interesting project and uh, we had the uh, support of the local congressman I can't recall his name anymore now, but uh, that helps get a lot of things done. Then in, night, uh, in October of 1974, after we had opened and everything was humming along pretty well, the Air Force said, uh, got a new assignment for you. You can either go to Thailand and do mission planning for F-105 fighter bombers or you can retire and you've got 90 days to retire. Well, with a total of 31 years in service and a family that wasn't interested in my being gone for a year, and uh, we decided to retire and so at the end of 1974 I retired from the Air Force as a lieutenant colonel. And in your retirement? Uh... Oh, yeah, that, all right forgot that idea. Uh, I didn't feel like not working. It seems kind of silly. You got a pretty good retirement pay and a nice home in Florida. So just about every week I would go off for three or four days uh, driving around the southeast 
We didn't want to live any farther north than Atlanta, Georgia. Which we had try Maine again, huh? Yeah, <laughs> which we had seen, uh, been through several times uh, in our trips to hither and yon. So I did that job search work for a year, a little over a year, and uh, in the early spring of 1976, I got a job with Marta, the uh, new subway style transportation system that was being developed for Atlanta. Uh, again, in project engineering type work, keeping an eye on what was going on. And uh, that lasted for about almost 15 years until I became 65. And then I pretty much had to give the whole thing up. Uh, so at the end of 1965, I retired and uh, we stayed on in Atlanta. We had a good, a good home. Uh, our daughter Gail was moving along in her education. See, this was 1976. Oh, she graduated from Duke in 1975. That was one thing we had planned on was to, uh, when we were in California, was to come out, come east. And uh, we gave her choices of colleges and she ended up picking Duke. And we came back east near the end of her freshman year. Our daughter Jane uh, was in high school. She finished that and uh, we had a, as I said, a very nice house that we were very happy with. Good yard, good gardening and stuff, and swimming pool, and uh, couldn't see any reason to make any changes in our lifestyle. And we lived in that situation for a total of nineteen seventy six to no, twenty fourteen. Uh, well it was about thirty seven years I think. And uh, it's the longest place any of us had lived in our life. <laughs> Even Fran living her first 22 years in Cincinnati. Uh, this was longer than that. So we said, uh, we're here and uh, we're staying until, and we did. There was a incident two months ago in April. Uh, did you want to talk about this honor flight? Oh, well, okay. Uh, we uh, heard about uh, something called 
the honor flight that this particular version or portion of it uh, was uh, managed by people in Conyers, Georgia, which is a, roughly an hour's drive away from uh, Atlanta, in which which was set up and had been set up for about 10 years or so to take veterans, fly them to Washington, D.C. to look at the various uh, military memorials that were there. And uh, although we'd spent four or five years in the D.C. area, the only things that were there were the Washington Monument and the uh, Lincoln Memorial. Uh, Jefferson Memorial. But they had not yet put up any memorials to honor the military service of the various conflicts. So, the, but by then, uh, they had the, the World War II Memorial, the Vietnam Memorial, Korean Memorial, Air Force Memorial, Another one or not? I can't Marines think. Marines have one. Yeah. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> so the the uh, the group, the management group in Conyers, uh, scheduled a trip to Washington, starting in Conyers. Uh, you'd leave Conyers at about 4.30 in the morning. They'd bus you into the Atlanta airport. Delta would fly you to Washington. The, uh, the group was composed of 25 basically World War II veterans. I don't know whether there was any others or not. Uh, and uh, what were called their guardians. And the only thing, it could be anybody except your spouse. And so my daughter came along as my guardian. The trip was free, is still, for the veteran and the Guardian at uh, $500, at least from the Conyers trip. We decided that uh, we can't get down to Conyers at 4.30 in the morning from home, since it's about an hour away, so we went down to Conyers on the afternoon of the day before, checked into a hotel, got up early in the morning, went, took our, got on a bus to in uh, Conyers to go to the Atlanta airport, got to the airport, were greeted and loaded aboard Delta, flew to Washington, Buses, bus took us uh, around to the 
war memorials and I had not seen any of the uh, special individual particular uh, memorials honoring veterans and, and uh, of uh, a particular conflict. So that was quite interesting to me and uh, a particular interest of course was the Air Force Memorial which is hard to describe but it's three concrete surfaced uh, pillars curved shooting up into the sky uh, almost in the fashion of three aircraft uh, performing that kind of a maneuver uh, Uh, it was all very, uh, very interesting, very well done. We bussed back to Conyers and went back into the hotel for the night because we didn't get back to Conyers till about 10.30 and didn't want to drive at midnight to back to Atlanta. And... Uh, That was the honor flight. Turns out that there, I didn't know at the time, they're, they're operated from many places in the United States to Washington for that function. Hey, did we have any, I don't have any other points uh, that your daughter had listed. Uh, did you have any other thoughts you wanted to make about your service and uh, your family? Well, family-wise, they were all very... Uh, I don't know what the word to want. Anyway, they were, they supported me in my military career. Very supportive. Uh, no matter what hardship it might have uh, dumped on them. The main, main hardship being Maine. <laughs> and other times when I was away, for instance, out in the Pacific Proving Ground, and there was no way they could, that my wife or any, any, uh, anybody could follow out there. I can, uh, only thank them for being so helpful and sometimes almost enthusiastic about what we were doing and where we were doing it. Dayton, Ohio, I had, uh, actually I had gone to high school and junior high school in Dayton born and raised in Cincinnati till I was about 10, 12. And uh, then we moved to Dayton and I went into the service from Dayton. Uh, my college work was at the University of Cincinnati, but it was a co-op co engineering where you worked 
half the time and I was working in Dayton at Wright Field, which is primarily the reason that I went to Wright Field after graduation and uh, started working there as a civilian engineer for the Air Force. We had uh, the only, I guess you might say, the only bouncing around the countryside that we took in, during the Air Force career was in 1952 when I was working, I had been recalled uh, during the Korean thing and was still working at Wright Field. Uh, I was uh, selected to go back to active flying job, uh, specifically at B-29s. And so the decision was, you're rusty. So you're going down to Houston, Texas, to Ellington Air Force Base for refresher training as a navigator. And then you will go to uh, Randolph Air Force Base to join a crew and go through in a B-29 and go through uh, basically a B-29 re refresher program since I had been in B-29s over in the Pacific. How long would a refresher program be? Uh, that depends depend, on how well you did. Depend, depends on the what your course is type, what kind, kind of thing you're trying to relearn. Uh, I think the navigation was only uh, about six weeks. It might have been longer. Uh, the time at uh, Randolph rejoining the B-29 world was a couple of months or so. That, that whole thing lasted from May through September into October, roughly, four or five months. After, uh, so we were living temporarily in Houston for a while, and then we got temporarily resettled in San Antonio for my time at Randolph. And then the assignment to B-29s was into uh, Barksdale Air Force Base in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, and we lived and settled down and got a house in Bossier City, Louisiana. In uh, nineteen, in the fall of nineteen fifty-two, in the in December of nineteen fifty-two, uh, my crew was among those. They, everybody went eventually at some time or another. Selected to go to a base in England for 90-day TDY. Uh, to show our muscles to the Russians.
my wife was pregnant with our first daughter and she didn't think that was a very good idea. So she, let's see, I got her to New York and uh, she headed for England on the Queen Mary. Arrived over there in mid-December. Uh, settled into a kind of a military family quarters that was not run by the military, but that's practically everybody there was were wives and I don't know if there were any children or not. And our first daughter was born in Oxford at the Radcliffe Infirmary. And uh, it was determined that she needed to stay in, in uh, England for a couple of months. Gail was born in February and my three months TDY was over in February so I had to go home. And they came into uh, back into New York on the French liner Liberté my mother was living in New York at the time, New York City, and she put them up. And the uprooting of families in the course of your 31 years, that's, uh, that's an episode that a lot of us hard to think of. I mean, I, my time in the service is only like six years uh, and not married, so I can't even relate to this, but uh, having a family and dragging them around the world, that's uh, quite a story in itself. Uh, I guess we've about covered uh, your service, and uh, I guess the only thing left to ask is if you had any, uh, well, I could ask Sue if she had any questions. The um, SPSC, was that the Space Science Center? Is that what they called it, do you remember? No, when I said SESP? SESP, was that That what was it? just the name of uh, uh, the, the initials for the name of the office that I was assigned to, the Space Experimental Oh, Space Experiment Support Program. That's it. Okay. Is what that was all about. That was Space Experiments Support, support Program. Program. Got it. That's what I was hoping to grab. Okay. So we were supporting people with space experiments by gotcha. providing them with yeah. rides out into the wild blue yonder. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, sir. Well, we have definitely covered a lot of ground, and uh, we are honored to have had this opportunity to talk with you and to hear your story. Uh, Certainly honored to do it for you. I hope it sounds more professional than the, than I figure it does. But <laughs> it sounds perfect. <laughs> Since I'm, I'm no Walter Cronkite when it comes to talking on television. No, you did a great job. Okay, well, we thank you for your time, for your service, and uh, our tip of the hat to uh, both you and your family. Well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you for taking the time to come, and thank you for your service. All right.